Lights, camera, action. <laughs> Is. Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast with Matthew and Haley Schmidt. What's new? Uh, we just finished watching the Silicon Valley finale, the last two episodes. Yeah, the series finale. Mm-hmm. What'd you think of it? Uh, you know, the finale wasn't quite what I wanted. It was like 50% there. Um, but I really enjoyed that show and I think there's, there are a lot of good laughs and good moments through the last two episodes. Yeah. I mean, the, the, whole, the entire last season was good, but, um, yeah, the two episodes we watched tonight were good. Yeah, the two episodes, they were funny, uh, very funny. I really liked the second to last episode, mm -hmm. but yeah, the, the finale, it was longer than, than the rest of them, which we didn't really realize till afterwards, but... But yeah, in the end, it just doesn't end the way I hoped it would. So, it was still funny. Kumail in this final season looking jacked for his role in the Marvel Eternals movie that he's going to be in later this year. Yeah, so, when does that come out? Ooh, I know it's 20 because 2020, it's only Black Widow and Eternals. I don't know what the storyline is for the Eternals at all. Yeah, Eternals is kind of different because it's very obviously cosmic the eternals are a race of beings that are basically immortal and it comes out november 6 2020 okay uh but yeah they're basically an immortal all-powering race and i think this movie spans over thousands and thousands of years oh okay i think at some point in the movie they become aware of the Avengers or something of that nature. So they're going to get looped into the rest of the MCU at some point. But yeah, let's see. The cast on this, which is a big cast, Angelina Jolie, Richard Madden, who was uh, um, in Game of Thrones. He was the brother that died at the Red Wedding. Rob Stark. Oh, oh okay. I feel bad. I <laughs> forgot that. <laughs> Kumail is in it. Uh, Salma Hayek, and Kit Harrington, another Game of Thrones. Game so of Thrones. those those are some people that are in it. Uh, but yeah, well, here's a quick premise. In a story spanning over 7,000 years, the Eternals, an immortal alien race created by the uh, Celestials, protect humanity from their evil counterparts, the Deviants. So, to a non-comic book fan, I mean, that's just good guys versus bad guys, but uh, in the comics, Thanos, I'm pretty sure, was... A deviant I'm trying to remember but anyways yeah it'll be a little different very space cosmic you know the these movies have gotten to a point where they're gonna have to get kind of weird and out there to you know keep getting bigger and bigger and better and better so that'll be an interesting movie yeah. uh that'll be similar to guardians of the galaxy i think where not a lot of people know about the eternals before the movie yeah. comes out with kind of like Guardians, but they pulled it off with Guardians, so hopefully uh, they pull it off with this one, too. Yeah, I hope you checked. Everyone had a chance to check out our quick breakdown on the Golden Globe nominations. We talked a little bit about the TV nominations, but mostly focus on the movie nominations. So check that out if you haven't already. Uh, here's what we have on tap for the episode today. We've got some awesome women this week in the trailer park current movie we're talking about this week is Knives Out, and then we will get into the 1959 Best Picture winner, which is Ben-Hur. So to kick off the trailers, this week we have Wonder Woman 1984, which is the sequel to, obviously, Wonder Woman. Um, it's set to come out June of next year. We've got Gal, Gal Gadot coming back as Diana Prince, aka Wonder Woman. Uh, Chris Pine's back is Steve Trevor, which is interesting because um, we're led to believe he dies in the first one. So I'm interested to see how he comes back and how he comes back, you know, 40 years later. 
ish, 40 years later? Is that kind of when this is taking place? Oh, more than that. The first one took place in World War One. Oh, it was World War One. Okay, I couldn't remember if it was yeah. um, a First or Second World War. Um, but anyway, so yeah, Chris Pine will be back. And then uh, Kristen Wiig is in this one, and she's playing the villain. Is that right? Yeah. It, based on the trailer, it seems like she's going to be someone who's kind of friendly or admires Wonder Woman mm -hmm. at the beginning. Uh, and then something must happen along the lines, because, yeah, she plays Cheetah, who is a villain, the villain of Wonder Woman. Patty Jenkins is back again to direct this. So, yeah, great cast, great direction again. It's, I feel like it's not one of those movies that's just, like, fitting into that 80s timeline again. I feel like the 80s are are coming back. Do we know why this one takes place in 1984, specifically? No, uh, I think Patty Jenkins just really wanted to have it set in the 80s to okay. have that kind of vibe to it. Okay. Kind of like Taika Waititi, kind of like that 80s-ish vibe for Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, and that's where a lot of people are comparing this one to that because Thor kind of had the same vibe, like col colorful, mm -hmm. um, yeah, just a little different than some of the other movies, so some people are comparing it to that a little bit fits into stranger things <laughs> that's i had that it's funny you said that i had that as one of my notes here for the trailer my second note is stranger things because yeah. the third season of stranger things was very similar to this it takes place in a mall and it has that same i swear the music in this trailer is like straight out of the stranger things trailer it yeah. it felt and sounded exactly the same yeah i feel like it's kind of an easy decade to lean on in terms of aesthetic and look so um it's easy to see how each of those kind of overlap or have those similarities mm -hmm. um but yeah obviously this will be super high on my list i'm really excited for it yeah kind of weird i know you said sequel which this is a sequel but uh patty jenkins has been on record lately saying that this is not a sequel according to her Okay. Uh, basically, she's just saying that because she doesn't want it to feel like it's connected. It wa she wants it to be like a standalone movie. She doesn't want it oh, to... Oh, okay. You know, I get what she's saying, but... Yeah. You have Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. You have <laughs> Chris Pine coming back as Steve. It's... I mean, it's a sequel, <laughs> but I, I get the point that she's going yeah, for. Yeah, so she, she wants the perspective to be like, this is a separate yeah. storyline. Yeah. With... The same people. Exactly. <laughs> like they wa She wants it to be like two separate movies, but just okay. about the same character. I All right. That was kind of interesting, but... Um, so. Yeah, so like I said, that, that one's coming out uh, June of next year. Yeah, but yeah. Well, I, had, I had more notes on, on it. Pedro Pascal is in this movie. The Mandalorian. Yep, he's in it. He seemed... I thought it was Nathan Fillion the first time I saw it, because he's the guy who was on the TV. He looked a lot like Nathan Fillion oh, to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I know the who you're talking guy. about now. The guy, yep. the guy, yeah, with, the the guy with the crystals. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you were, you were kind of saying, I wonder how Steve uh, Trevor comes back. Uh, I think... Do you think he's actually back? You think he's like... A figment of her imagination. That's a possibility some people have thrown out there. Hmm. That would make me really sad. Cause if I, that's all he is. I don't I don't think he's a figment. Like some people I've heard some people say that. Hmm. I don't think he's a figment of her imagination, but I think he is like an art of like Okay, so in the trailer, the, he's in the commercial, Pedro Pascal is in the commercial saying, like, if you want something, take it, or something along those lines. I think he somehow through maybe through the crystals has a power where he can kind of grant wishes because that's what he's saying like just wish it mm -hmm. and then he has a scene where he's holding the crystals and he says some long lines of and now it's my turn so i wonder if he has some weird thing where when someone makes a wish it gets granted and then he gets to make a wish in response to that because there's a scene where diane is looking up and a plane is flying so she's obviously thinking about Steve because that's how he died, was in a yep. plane. Yeah. So I wonder if Diana wishes for Steve to, like, come back to life, and then he's there. Hmm. Okay. And then Pedro, like, makes a wish in response to that. And I'm wondering if that's how Kristen Wiig gets her powers, too. She kind of wishes to get power at some point, and that's how she becomes Cheetah. All right. 
So that was just something I I, I thought I had while watching the trailer. Uh, and you brought this up the first time we watched it. It's a lot brighter. They made her suit a lot brighter. Yeah, her suit's Colors got a lot really... more color to it. Yeah, like the, the red and the blue, the gold is a lot brighter. Ooh, and also I think my favorite part is at the end of the trailer, she's got this full gold, um, like full body suit with wings. It looks super cool. Yep, that's... Uh, that's... She's got like a partial like face mask kind of thing like around her jaw too which looks it looks really cool so yeah the costuming top notch mm, yeah that's i was trying to find it but that's a that's a armor or suit that she's had in the comics before so when the posters were released and her suit was gold people were wondering if she'd show up in that and the trailer reveals yeah. that she will so that's really cool yep yeah, yep yeah. but yeah that, that's all i had on 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 that trailer i just wanted to bring up pedro and you know, maybe what, maybe how and why Steve is back. Mm-hmm. So, next up we have Mulan, the next uh, live action remake from Disney. And this, to me, like this is the type of live action remake to do. Like I, you know, like Jungle Book, Lion King, they look cool, but it's, you know, at at the end of the day, it's still animated. This is like taking a person's story and like really expounding upon it i am so excited for this movie yeah, i you, you couldn't wait to talk i about this. get chills like watching the trailer when they like come in towards the end with like their little remake version of, of reflection. the yeah oh so good um so yeah of course the story is you know this uh chinese village and each family is supposed to offer up you know, their son, like a boy from the family to fight. And Mulan is just her and her sister. And so her dad says he'll fight, but she's like, no, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm yeah, super, super excited for this. The woman who plays Mulan, her name is Yifei Lu. And I haven't seen her in anything, but the dad you'd probably recognize. Um, he also played the dad in the farewell. Um, he's done a number of shows to he was in Silicon Valley. Uh, he's in Man in the High Castle, too, which are the two things that I definitely recognize him from. Who was he in Man in the High Castle? Uh, he's the... I don't remember exactly, actually. Okay, I don't... Yeah. But, but he is. I, okay. I remember him from that. This looks probably better than most of the... At least the recent ones with Aladdin and Lion King. This looks better than any of the other live-action remakes that Disney's come out with recently uh they were definitely going for a like a darker more realistic version of this movie mm-hmm. versus uh some of the other ones that because uh, this is based off a real chinese folklore like story or myth mm-hmm. uh and the cartoon apparently got away from that for obvious reasons they kind of turned into a musical and you know added, have uh, a added talking Eddie Murphy. Yeah. comedic <laughs> dragon yeah, yeah. So they were going for the more like a story that was closer to the real, you know, myth, which is why they decided to not include Mushu. Actually, I think they might have asked Eddie Murphy to do it, but he said no, and then they decided not to have Mushu in it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the remix of Reflection was awesome. I love it when they do that with songs. You know, you you want to keep it there so you know what it is, but just change it up a little bit. Uh, so the music in this was inspiring and kind of got you pumped up. I know, I know it did for you, but just the music overall was great in the trailer. Uh, I thought it was interesting. I think they're, I thought they would go like full on realistic the whole time, but they do have some magic in this. Like the guy starts, run, uh, the villain starts running up the, the great wall, mm-hmm. like vertically. And then he has a sorceress, uh, as a sidekick of his. So they did include some magic in this, probably a little bit more than I thought they would, but we'll see how it plays out in the movie. Yeah. Uh, Jet Li is back. I thought that was awesome. He's the emperor. Yeah. It's yeah, nice seeing right. him on the screen. Uh, do you, do you think they're going to have any like sing, like song moments in this where like the, the cast starts breaking out in song in the middle of it? I, I don't think they will, and I think part of that is, I've heard some people saying, like, they're really trying to keep this more traditional, more in line with the actual story, and paying tradition to that instead of trying to turn it into a more 
gimmicky musical kind of trope. It so is, I, I think this is going to be like an actual, like, this is a movie about yeah. the, the war, more just or less. Just a straight, like, action drama yeah. movie. Yeah. I just bring that because in the trailer at one point that... In the cartoon, there's that famous training montage when they sing, uh, I'll make a man out of you. Mm-hmm. And they, they say that in the trailer, the when she's at camp, one of the her commander says, we're going to make men out of you. So it's like, are they just going to have lines like that that kind of hint at the songs? Or, or are they going to break out into a song at that yeah, point? Yeah, like it might, yeah, they might have lines to kind of pay homage. But, you know, I could see... Every great movie has a great montage, so that could certainly be, like, a montage scene where they're training, and may- maybe it's not that they're singing, but maybe that's, like, the the music in the background. Okay, yeah. Just the soundtrack of it. Because I, to- I totally understand they're going for the more realistic, you don't necessarily want them to break out in song, but this movie does have, you know, Let's Make a Man Out of You, which is probably one of the most more famous Disney songs of all time, so it's like you don't want to. They might not want to completely ignore it, but at least, you know, mention it a little bit. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So this one's coming out March twenty twenty. So perfect uh, spring break Easter time movie. Next we have Little Women, which was directed by Greta Gerwig. She also uh, adapted the screenplay from the Louisa May Alcott novel. We've talked about Greta Gerwig a few times, um, probably on the Golden Globe episode, I guess, the most. She she did Lady Bird, uh, which came out last year, nominated for Academy Award there. Saoirse Ronan plays Joe, and Emma Watson plays Meg. We also have Timothy Chalamet. He plays Laurie in this one. And then, of course, Laura Dern and Meryl Streep are in this as well. So uh, a lot of big names for this cast. Yeah, this I've never read the book. There was a movie that came out. I mean, there's probably been multiple movies that have come out based yeah, on this. Yeah, I think but so. One came out in the '90s with Winona Ryder, who got nominated for an Oscar for that movie. Uh, so I haven't seen any iteration of this, but I'm very excited to see it based on the trailer. I love the cast. Meryl Streep seems to be playing kind of a, maybe not the nicest person in this movie. Yeah, she seems a little rough around the edges. Uh, it kind of makes a comment like, oh, well, I didn't have to marry because I'm rich, but you, you should. You have to. Or, <laughs> yeah. or, or uh, what's their show? Joe? That Joe. Your, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or she's like, oh, Joe is crazy. You are the future of this family. She says it to another one of her sisters who's going down a more traditional life style path uh based on the trailer but yeah i like i like movies where people kind of break barriers or like do things that they're not supposed to be told because they believe they should because throughout this whole trailer uh people are telling joe you have to marry you have to do this if you write a story the woman needs to get married by the end of it and she's like no like fuck that like i want to do what i want i I love stories where people just do that where they do what they want to do even though they're being told otherwise and just for me I I always like having the one like in this trailer it's Timothy Chalamet where he's a character on the other side of the line where like she wants to do stuff on her own and Timothy Chalamet is kind of well he's a man so he's kind of part of the problem for her where all these men are telling her what to do but he's sympathetic towards her so I kind of like having that sympathetic character for people to connect with, you know, for his side of things. They have that scene where they're dancing outside because she doesn't want to be seen in public with her, like, burnt dress or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I think that scene was kind of cute. I like stuff like that in movies. And uh, I will say, whenever I think of this book or movie, Little Women, I just think of that episode of Friends. Oh, yeah. Jennifer Aniston's uh, Rachel is always reading Little Women over and over again, and Joey yeah. reads The Shining over and over again. <laughs> So they decide to switch. That's right. And then by the end, Joey is just very connected with the characters, the <laughs> little women, and he's crying because I think someone dies in the end. But uh, And then he always did that thing with The Shining where he'd put it in the freezer because it was too scary for him. <laughs> yeah. So then Rachel's like, oh, let's, you want to put it in the freezer? And he's like, yeah, I want to put little women in the freezer. So I always, I always think of that episode of oh Friends whenever gosh. little women gets brought up. Yeah, no, that's funny. I... And, you know, I never read the book. I haven't seen any 
movies that have been done on this. So, and and honestly, I don't think I ever really knew what it was about. But yeah, this trailer has me really excited. I don't mm-hmm. think I ever knew that this is what the story was about. So it seems really interesting. Uh, probably the <laughs> the biggest turnoff maybe is uh, Emma Watson's American accent. I, I had that written down as something <laughs> to bring up Emma Watson's accent. I mean, oh. she only says like one thing in the trailer. She has one line in the trailer, and she and does you not think it's that well. bad already? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> she can't. She says the word important as important, and I'm like, nope. No, she can't. She can't right. say what. It's good. She's good and has a good accent and perks of being a wild fl- uh, wallflower. No, no, no. I See, think she does. I, I, and that's where I first noticed it. I'm like, wow, this is really bad. But, you know, I'm sure she's gotten better at it. It's based on the trailer for Little Women. It doesn't seem like her American accent's gotten any better. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> getting destroyed we'll already. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this one's coming out Christmas Day, so right around the corner. Yep, this is what we'll probably be reviewing this one down the road. And I know I said in the Golden Globe episode, uh, but I hope Greta Gerwig gets an Oscar nomination for this movie. One last thing I'll say about the trailers this week before we move into um, our breakdowns is that all three of these movies are directed by women directors. So Patty Jenkins, Nikki Caro... Greta Gerwig, they're paving the way for fantastic female directors. I love it. They've all made good movies. I didn't realize that Mulan was being directed by Nikki Caro. She great movies. The one I always think of is Whale Rider, yeah. which isn't a movie that I think a lot of people know about. Uh, the child, act, the female like kid actor in that got a Best Actress nomination for that movie. But I remember my my brother, I think, of all people, is really into that movie. We owned it on, I think, VHS. And I watched it numerous times. It was a really good movie. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. Um, But, you know, obviously remember when it came out and recognized the name when I was looking at her uh, IMDb page. It looks like her most recent project before this was The Zookeeper's Wife. With Jessica Chastain, which rang a bell. I don't think it was, you know, all that popular, but, uh, I, you know, it was something that looked familiar to me, so I thought I would bring that up. Okay, so this week's current film that we are talking about is Knives Out. I feel like, so we saw this over Thanksgiving weekend. I feel like every person I talk to when, uh, you know, we get back home, get back into the office, everyone's like, yeah, I saw Knives Out this weekend. It seemed like it was huge. For its Thanksgiving opening. Yeah, I don't know how it did at the box office. I'm sure it did really well. But Frozen 2 came out around the same time, which is more, you know, it's going to do better at the box office because you can take uh, everyone, like the kids to it. But yeah, it's getting a lot of great uh, reviews. It's getting a lot of attention. I had people asking me if I'd seen it and how it was. So yeah, I mean, it's got a fairly big director, too, in Ryan Johnson, since he did the last uh, Star Wars movie. And it's got a huge cast. Uh, it's kind of an ensemble cast, if anything, because who's, uh, I think you have, who's in it? So, yeah, uh, Ryan Johnson wrote and directed this in terms of the cast. Daniel Craig plays the detective Benoit Blanc. He's got this super thick southern Cajun accent, which was really funny. Christopher Plummer plays the the patriarch of the family, Harlan Thromby. Jamie Lee Curtis plays his daughter. Chris Evans plays her son. Uh, and an actress who's maybe newer to the scene, but I feel like we've mentioned her name a few times in the last few episodes, Ana de Armas is in this. Who I didn't realize she was going to play as big of a role in this movie as she did. Like, I knew she, she was going to be in it. I didn't realize she was going to be like, the lead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we also have Michael Shannon's in it. Yeah, who plays this? Walt, Christopher Plummer's son. So his sibling is Jamie Lee Curtis's character, as well as uh, he's his sister-in-law is Tony Collette, because Tony Collette had married into the family and then he had died Mm -hmm. so she's kind of hanging around the family still with with her daughter and then uh don johnson plays chris evans's dad ransom's dad ransom is chris evans and so he's the husband of jamie lee curtis in the movie so yeah huge cast 
and uh, they all did great. The two kind of leads or standouts I thought were Ana de Armas and Daniel Craig, of course. Yeah, I think the one that played Marta. So Marta plays uh, Christopher Plummer's nurse. Mm -hmm. Christopher Plummer's character's name is Harlan, and Marta is is his nurse. And so, yeah, she ends up being kind of the central character in Mm -hmm. all of this. Uh, I... I love the whodunit kind of aspect to it, and it was perfect because Harlan Thrombey is this world-renowned mystery author, and he lives in this huge eccentric mansion on top of this hill. It's like takes place in like the fall time, so it's like misty and the leaves are falling. So it's like perfect atmosphere yeah. for this. Kind of murder mystery. Because yeah. he very much loves the theatrics, his Harlan does. Like he his I'm glad you mentioned the mansion. That was something I loved. It reminded me of like of Clue. Cause yeah, it's just this giant old style mansion with a lot of rooms and hidden passageways and Harlan very much loves living that lifestyle. He writes these mystery books, but kinda not necessarily pretends that he lives that life, but he kind of loves the theatrics. Yeah, and, you know, each character, to me, they each felt so distinct and so unique. They each had their own, like, deplorable characteristics, but you also kind of found yourselves, like, rooting for them in different ways. I don't know if you felt the same way, but yeah, that's kind of how I, how I looked at them. I agree, but they're, they're all very different and distinct and... Uh, one thing I love about this movie, uh, that it gives each, cause obviously Harlan is dead. Like he gets, he's, he's dead at the beginning of the movie. It's in the trailers. It's not a spoiler. And I love that they go into detail on each of the characters and they give a reason for each of the characters to have motive to kill Harlan, yep. which I loved. Cause then you, you don't really know what's going on. Each of them have a legitimate reason to kill him. So yeah, you ex- don't know, yeah, exactly. As they're going, like you said, person by person. So Jamie Lee Curtis is the daughter, Linda. She mm-hmm. has a super successful career. I think it's in real estate, maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, so, you know, she's really well off. And you have the son, Walt, who's played by Michael Shannon. And he runs the publishing company for all of Harlan's mystery novels. So he has a lot at yeah. stake. Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then, like we mentioned, Tony Collette's character. I don't have her name written down. Uh, Lonnie. Joni, sorry, Joni. <laughs> Joni, Tony, Lonnie. Uh, so Tony Collette's character, Joni, like she, like you mentioned, she's Harlan's daughter-in-law. And she has stayed close with the family, and her big tie to everything is that she's always relied on Harlan for money for herself and then also to take care of her daughter. So mm-hmm. everyone kind of has their own mo- motives and relationships yeah. And like we mentioned, Chris Evans is a big character in this too. So he plays Harlan's grandson, Ransom. And Mm -hmm. he is basically the one in the family that does nothing. Yeah, none of them like him. They think he's kind of an asshole. Yep, yep. So again, just more reason for everyone to kind of hate each other and everyone have uh, ulterior motives. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a really great kind of network that they go through to try to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I had here to talk about, because it's hard to talk about this movie without spoilers, uh, I like Daniel Craig's performance a lot. I loved his accent. He really nailed it, I thought. And he reminded me a lot of uh, kind of an Inspector Clouseau or Hercule Perrault. Sure. Where he's like this renowned detective, but he's got these weird quirks, and he's kind of goofy at the same time. Yeah, maybe not 100% polished. Yeah, like there's a scene where he's uh, sitting in a car waiting for Marta's character to like come out of a, a store or something, and he's got headphones in, and he's like singing along to a song, so he's got like these goofy scenes that kind of make you laugh, but... Uh, he can he figures things out really quick and he's really sharp. So he kind of reminded me of some of those classic inspectors, which I liked. Yeah, I think that's a really good comparison. And and one thing that I think was fun is so like you have these detectives who are 
interviewing members of the family and going step by step. And so we kind of figured out along with the detectives. Mm, at the same time, we know things that the detectives don't know, which yeah. is kind of uh, fun as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, what I think maybe one other thing I would add before we talk about our scores is uh, I thought the music was really great, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nathan Johnson is the one who did the music, and I think there was, he, he did really well with that kind of mysterious, eerie kind of aspect. A lot of string instruments, so I think that really added to the tension. So that definitely, you know, pulled all the other pieces together. Let's see, do we want to go with scores right now? Who wanted to go first? You can go first. Okay. I gave this movie a 9.2. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I thought I love whodunits, but they can be tough to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of have to have that right. Got to tell that line with giving enough information to the audience uh, where we can kind of figure it out along the way or when they have that big reveal, we can go back and say, oh, they were showing us, they were telling us the whole right. time. Uh, versus giving us making it too obvious mm-hmm. or not obvious enough where, where they I feel like they'll just pull a twist out of their ass and it's like well that doesn't make any sense that yeah. came out of nowhere and I thought this movie was perfect they did give you uh, hints or clues along the way and uh, so I thought it was great in that aspect and I think it's just tough to do a modern day who done it these days uh, and I thought that Ryan Johnson totally killed it. Yeah, I think he did a great job. I gave this one an 8.7. I thought it was such a fun movie. Uh, There were really funny moments. The characters were just absurd. A really twisting plot. Like you said, there were enough pieces along the way. Like I told myself, I'm like, okay, pay attention to as much as you can and see if you can figure this out. Like I always try to, you're really good at doing that. I'm usually someone that I, I just kind of, let sit there and absorb uh, yeah it. <laughs> yeah i just kind of let everything happen and i love the reveal at the end and this one i wanted to say i wonder if i can figure this out uh i i didn't quite see it coming but there were a few things where i'm like okay hold hold on to that they haven't come back around to that so it, it was fun that they gave you enough pieces to kind of see where you were going you like you said it was the right amount of give you enough clues that when the reveal happened you understood it, mm-hmm. but not too obvious. So, yeah, an 8.7 for me. Nice. Very high score for you. Nice. Uh, last thing for for this, uh, some Oscar nominations I hope or think it might get. I was hesitant to say that it might get a Best Picture nomination because I feel like I say that a lot, but just whodunits don't always get, you know, the Best Picture buzz uh, that other just straight dramas get, but... It did come out and it got nominated for Golden Globe, which it is for the comedy section, which those always those don't always get represented that well when it does come to Oscar season. But it gave me some hope, so I'm gonna say that I, I think it'll get nominated for <laughs> for Best Picture. I don't think it's gonna get nominated for Best Director. I think that category is just too strong this year. Yeah. Uh, I hope. I don't think it, it probably won't happen, but I hope Daniel Craig gets nominated for Best Actor. I would love it if uh, Ana de Armas gets nominated for like Best Supporting Actress or maybe Best Actress because she was fantastic in the movie. And then I just I hope Brian Johnson gets a writing nomination so that he can get at least something for this movie. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I w- I would really love to see this nominated for screenplay because um, yeah, the the story was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Anything else uh, before we get into uh, no. spoilers? No, let's we'll we'll go into spoilers now. So if you don't want to get this movie uh, spoiled for you, jump ahead. And I will say, uh, if you haven't seen it, I would I would just go see it instead. But for those who want to keep listening, uh, we will jump into spoilers now. So. Yeah, so to kind of set the scene, like we said, Harlan Thrombey, he's a mystery writer, and I think this takes place, like, right after his 85th birthday, is that yeah, right? Like his I've, 85th, yeah. which is funny, because Christopher Plummer is 89 in real life, so they, they <laughs> like, age him. <laughs> Ooh, good job, dude. Um, so he passes away, and the movie kind of starts, there are two detectives that have already been, you know, kind of part of the investigation. They've basically said... You know, we've ruled it a suicide. 
but then Lakeith Stanfield. Yeah, Lakeith Stanfield is one of the detectives. We didn't him we didn't mention him, uh, which I feel bad about. <laughs> um, I, I I was going to mention his name earlier and just slipped my mind. But so he's one of the two detectives there, and then uh, Daniel Craig's character of Benoit Blanc is hired as a private investigator anonymously he's hired mm-hmm. anonymously yep. to look further into this yep. yeah they're kind so of, that's kind of where the movie starts yeah they're kind of this takes it starts out after the death, the death of harlan so yeah they're kind of bringing everyone in who was at the, his birthday party for questioning one last time yeah with daniel with block there yeah so he's kind of one by one interviewing the members of the family and like we mentioned everyone kind of has their own potential motive for why they would want him dead you know mostly because like he he's a mass you know obviously he has this huge mansion he's done well for himself with his books and all of his writing so really his like his will his his estate is kind of what everyone's focusing on mm-hmm yeah, and something I liked during the whole interview process, because the first part of this movie is, like you mentioned, the two cops and then Blanc uh, interviewing each of the relatives, and that's when you find out that they each had their own motive for killing Harlan because it's ruled a suicide, but Blanc is kind of questioning that. Uh, I like how each character would say a story to him that was like a, a nice puffed up story. But then they would show a flashback at the same time, and the flashback was what actually happened. Yes, yes. And you would see the arguments and everything. So, like, Walt, Michael Shannon's character, his motive might be uh, Harlan, the night of his birthday and death, told him that he was firing him from his job. And uh, Don Johnson, who's married to Harlan's daughter, uh, Harlan found out that he was cheating on on her so you know they, they kind of have a motive for each one of them but it's i thought it was cool how the characters told one version of the story but then the flashbacks would show what actually happened yeah that's that's true and, and that goes to that point where you were saying we're figuring things out with the detective but also they're giving us more information yeah, than like, the detectives like actually that. have i like that they're showing us what actually happened so we know but the detectives don't quite know yet Yep. So, I like that. Yep. Um, so, yeah, things really get interesting when they start talking to Harlan's nurse, Marta. Uh, she's, you know, more... I mean, she's she's a nurse in the sense that he's not completely decrepit, but she's there to keep an eye on him, uh, provide his medications, and, you know, he does, or she does offer some sort of, like, companionship to yeah, him. Yeah, she's, too. like, a friend. Yeah. I mean, she's his best friend. Yeah. Uh, so we find out that, you know, there's some, you know, stages to what everyone says, okay, th- this is what happened, the party, here's the exact time everyone left, and like you said, everyone's saying this is exactly what happened. And then we see all of Marta's flashbacks. Mm-hmm. And she goes up to this uh, Harlan's study, which is where he's found deceased the next morning. And you see in her flashback that they start playing a game, like a, a board game that they play every night. And she's giving him all of his medications, which are, they're all like intravenous drugs. And so she has her little kit with a bunch of different vials and syringes and so she gives him two shots and then she's like hey how about we have a little extra fun with this painkiller and she pulls it up (laughs) yeah with the morphine and she realizes oh my gosh i switched up the bottles yeah because because he like she he she beats him in whatever board game they're playing so he knocks the board over but the the drugs were on the stand the whatever the board was on so they fall to the ground too so that's kind of how she mixes them up yeah so she ends up giving him accidentally a lethal dose of morphine and so and she doesn't have the narcan yeah she doesn't have the narcan she's like i swear it's here i swear i have it but she can't find it yeah and so because they live middle of nowhere in the mansion she's like if i call 911 right now like you you have 10 minutes before you od she still says that they should call 911 but 
they do mention that they're really far away. Yeah, so she's like, you have 10 minutes before you OD, and he's like, look, you know what? They won't make it. We don't have anything to reverse this, so... And he's he's like, I, I'm I'm okay with it, more or less. He's kind of at peace with it, and he's like, okay, but I don't want you getting in trouble for this. So these are the steps that you need to take. And he, like, yeah. outlines a perfect plan for her to, like, do this, this, this. We don't need to get into the specific details, but he sets everything up mm-hmm. perfectly for her. Do this and this and this. And because he, he knows all the in- intricacies of who goes in and out of the mansion and where, like, security cameras are and the things that each person in his family are going to pay attention to. So he sets it up perfectly that make sure you do this in front of this person and make sure you do this at exactly this time and... You won't be in trouble. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was genius. Yeah. I mean, it's like, what what else do you expect from a mystery writer? <laughs> yeah. <it> was, <laughs> to, like, set, set up his own kind that, of elaborate Yeah, and that's plot. where, like, he's really into the theatrics of it. Because, mm-hmm. like, he lays it all out for her. Uh, and then, but yeah, so she, we see that through flashbacks. Meanwhile, she's in present day interviewing with uh, Blanc, but she can't necessarily lie because her character has this interesting condition where whenever she tells a lie, her body convulses and she she has the need to puke. Yep. So, which, would you think of that trait, that <laughs> characteristic, or however you want to label it? It was so ridiculous, but I think it offered a lot of interesting points in the story because when we're first introduced to it we're like oh wow well why don't they just ask her everything because anything she knows she won't be able to lie about but then once they get into the you know kind of flashback scene and you see harlan knows this about her and so he's like okay if anyone questions you this is how you have to say it. So Mm -hmm. when she's she's, talking with Benoit... She's not lying. Right. But she's not saying the absolute truth. Yes, exactly. So I thought that was funny. Yeah, I thought the trade was fine. They didn't overuse it, which it is a ridiculous thing. Like, I don't know (laughs) if that's a real condition or not, uh, but uh, I thought they didn't overuse it, so I thought it was used uh, fairly well. They even use it in a couple funny ways where... Daniel Craig will, like, confirm information with her, and then she has to run off in the corner and puke in a pot. Yeah, that was kind um, of funny. But, yeah, so she has that condition, so she's going through the interview process, and she isn't she isn't lying, but she isn't exactly saying the entire truth. Uh, but, anyway, so later on down the road, they have the will reading, which everyone shows up for. That's when we get introduced to Ransom, Chris Evans' character, because the night of the murder, he got in an argument with Harlan and stormed out early but he's early uh uh, but he's early for the will reading which a couple people take note of uh and then during the will reading it's announced that the entire estate and everything that harlan owned is actually left to marta so the family is outraged you know they've been so nice to her the whole movie but now they kind of turn on her and they're like you need to give us all this money back Uh, and she's kind of freaked out and this is when Ransom appears to start helping her. He, um, you know, get she gets in the car with him, and they drive away, away from the crazy family. And uh, she confesses everything to him, like what happened, how she's kind of responsible accidentally for Harlan's death, and, and how she laid everything out that night. And so he, he starts to help her just because the whole family hates him. So he's like, I'm going to screw them back and make sure you get to keep this money. Mm-hmm. But eventually, Ransom does confess to the police, like, Marta's involvement with Harlan's death. So Blanc and Marta, they have, they have a chat, and she's getting ready to confess to the family her involvement and right as she is about to do it uh block figures something out and he stops her so she she doesn't confess and he gets everyone out of the house except for marta the pol- the policeman and then the person that he announces there's an actual murderer here there is like a an actual killer 
and they bring which, in... Which we don't think there is, necessarily. Yeah, at, at this point, at this point, yeah, I mean, we're told how he dies so early on. Uh, I thought most of this movie was just going to be Marta trying to cover her tracks, because there's mm-hmm. a couple times throughout the movie where they're about to discover something that would give her away, and she, like, has to cover it up. So, yeah, throughout this movie, you're not really sure if there's an actual uh, killer or not, but at the end... Blanc reveals that it is actually Ransom. Chris Evans' character is the actual murderer, and the way they explain it is... So Ransom got in an argument with Harlan the night of his birthday, and it's revealed that Harlan tells Ransom that he's leaving everything to Marta. Yep. So Ransom's pissed, storms out, and then uh, he sneaks back in later that night, without anyone knowing it, that he switches the labels on the morphine and the medicine. Mm-hmm. And then he's the one that takes out the like cure or the... The Narcan, which the, is the... What would help him with to the treat morphine the overdose. overdose. Yep, so he takes it. And so when Marta switched them, it's revealed she actually gave him... The, the correct, correct dosage. dosage of the correct medicine, and he wasn't in danger of dying at all. So it's kind of a dark twist there, where there is revealed to be an actual moti- like motivated killer, because he actually, um, uh, the housekeeper who discovers Harlan's body gets kidnapped at one point, or not kidnapped, but she gets attacked at one point, and goes to the hospital, like the actual killer attacks her and while she's in the hospital or not while she's in the hospital but marta uses her like vomit condition kind of against ransom because the hospital calls marta about the the maid that's in the hospital and says oh she's still alive and she knows that ransom was the one that attacked her so then after that ransom admits to everything uh and the whole time marta's kind of looking a little uneasy but ransom admits to everything and then in that moment, she just pukes in his face. So she lied about the housekeeper mm-hmm. being alive and, and ratting Ransom out. The housekeeper actually died, but she held the vomit in long enough to, for Ransom to spill his guts and confess to everything. So I love this movie. I like that they kind of, it was a little different where they revealed how he died early on, but they still kind of had that twist in the end where there was an actual killer. And there were clues along the way. You you had mentioned at one point because Ransom is such an asshole and everyone hates him in the family, including the dogs. Yeah. That they are constantly barking at him. And you had mentioned at one point in the movie they mentioned that the dogs had barked around 3 a.m. And yeah. that was something that you kind of hung on to and you were like, I need to keep remembering that. And that was like a hint that Ransom was the one that snuck in because the dogs were barking and they always bark at him. Yep, yep. So, yeah, that was good. And, and I think for me, the the last piece that, you know, really tied the whole thing together. Uh, so the movie opens with this housekeeper bringing Harlan his morning coffee in a cup that says, uh, my, I don't remember the order exactly, but it's like, my house, my coffee, my rules, something like that, mm-hmm. whatever, right? And the movie ends with, Marta standing on one of the balconies at at the mansion while all of the family drives away, and she's sipping on this mug that says "My house, my coffee, my mm-hmm, rules." I was yeah. like, "Oh, that was so cool!" I love that. That was the final shot of her just standing over them, where they're all outside the house, and she's just standing on the ba- balcony with a blanket and that mug, and it's just like, "Yep, you guys are done. You're terrible people. I own this place." Yeah, yeah, and and I think it was cool too that you know when they revealed that. Marta actually gave him the correct med, correct dosage or the correct medication. Uh, Detective Blanc points out, like, subconsciously, you knew. Because even though the labels were different, you're a good enough nurse to recognize the difference in the viscosity and the difference between the two different, um, like, medications. So I, I'm glad that he, he even played up on the fact that, yeah, it looked like a mistake, but instinctually you knew what you were doing was correct Mm -hmm. so like she really came out clean and all this which was yeah which was good yep Uh, yeah that was the whole point of it was that she really didn't do anything wrong and it's kind of reassuring her of how good of a nurse she was so yep was there anything that 
you didn't like or thought could have been better in the movie? Not really. No, nothing that stands out anyway. Because okay. yeah, one thing, I was a little disappointed with this part initially, but the more I think about it, it's less of an issue. Like, was part of you disappointed at all that there wasn't an actual, like, I know Chris Evans in the end is kind of the bad guy, but, like, early on in the movie when it was revealed that Marta just accidentally overdosed him and then he, like, cut his own throat to make it seem like a suicide. Part of me was like, oh, so there isn't going to be, like, a killer? Yeah. Part of me was slightly disappointed because I like that traditional, <laughs> you know, I have that... Someone actually yeah, did it. I like that traditional, oh, murdered person who did it, uh, which they, they kind of twist it in the end so there was an actual killer. But for a little part of that beginning, I was like, oh, is there not going to be an actual murderer? And he just accidentally died and killed himself? Uh, you know, I don't know. I didn't know how I felt about that. But they kind of turn it around by the end, so I wasn't as disappointed with that. But early on in the movie, I did kind of have that feeling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's fair. We can move right along into this week's Best Picture winner. This one's from 1959. An oldie but a goodie, Ben 60 Hur. 60 years ago. Came out 60 oh, years yeah. ago, if you think about it like Jeez. that. Jeez. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Winner of 11 Oscars, uh, Ben-Hur. Yeah, this one was, give you some background, some of the big players in this, was directed by William Wyler, who also did Roman Holiday, which is a pretty... Oh, that's a good movie. Yeah. Pretty popular I know, movie. I know the name William Wyler, like, I think he's won at least two Oscars. I know he's done a lot of good movies, but I didn't realize he did Roman Holiday. That is a good one. Yeah. We've got Charles Charlton Heston as the main character. He plays Judah Ben Hur. Uh, I mean, he he's a huge name. I feel like anyone uh, would recognize him from this. He was obviously in the Ten Commandments. He was in the original Planet of the Apes movies as well. Uh, Stephen Boyd plays Masala as one of the supporting characters, and we also have Hugh Griffith as Sheik Ilderim. Uh, I had not heard of either of these two before. This movie, but they do have some other nominations, some good credits to their name, so just wanted to bring them up. I don't know if you rec- recognize them or know them oh, from yeah. anything um, else. Hugh Griffith was in Tom Jones, which we'll talk about eventually oh, okay. on this. That's right. I did see that when yeah. I was looking into this. And yeah, uh, Jack uh, Hawkins is in this too. He is in the movie that we'll review next week, Bridge on the River Kwai. Charleston Heston, this is his iconic role. This is his only Oscar nomination, and he won for it, so... Um, this is like his the role that he's for the most part remembered for. So, like you mentioned earlier, this had twelve Oscar nominations. It won eleven of them. Uh, the only award that it did not win was adapted screenplay. A few uh, kind of notable moments. So, Charlton Heston and Hugh Griffith each won their acting nominations. Charlton Heston for the leading, and then Hugh Griffith won for his supporting role. Uh, another interesting point, the <laughs> in their 11 wins, two of them were pos- posthumous. One person had died during filming, and someone uh, else had died uh, before the award ceremony. So one of the producers for Best Picture, Sam Zimbalist, he was the one who uh, passed away during filming. So his award in Best Picture was posthumous, and then one of the Art decorators, set decoration, Hugh Hunt. He was also deceased at the time of the award ceremony. So uh, just kind of an interesting thing that I wanted to know. Uh, so yeah, I'll just uh, run through what happens in this movie. So it opens uh, actually with the birth of Jesus. It opens on the manger and there's a bright light from the sky that drops down and, uh, and they're depicting the birth of Jesus Christ. And then after that it moves to... Um, Judea, where the Romans, I think, have control of that area, and they send someone to kind of maintain the peace at Judea, and that person is Masala, who his who, who grew up in Judea, so they think he's going to kind of keep things smooth, like smooth things over, because he's also childhood friends with Judah Ben-Hur, uh, who is kind of the person that's most respected in that area you know he's in a wealthy family and and looks out for his people so he's kind of viewed as the leader so you know there's a nice 
reunion scene where they see each other for the first time in years. They hug. Things are good for a little while. But then Masala, because there's tension between uh, the Romans and the people of Judea. So Masala asks Ben-Hur or Judah to kind of rat out the people that are causing the most problems for the Romans. Yeah, like, he wants them to reveal, like, the people who are dissenting, yep. basically. Yeah. He, yep. And Judah refuses to do it because, you know, he's a man of the people. And that's when they kind of have a falling out. Uh, they have an argument, and there's this parade uh, later on in the movie where this Roman, I don't know if he's a politician or just a really important person or whoever... But he's part of this parade, kind of going through the streets of Judea. And uh, Judah's, I can't remember if it's his sister or his mom, but they, they're on the rooftop of their house, and they're kind of leaning over to get a better look. And one of the shingles of the house... Like the, like a... Uh, like, yeah, it's like, yeah, a tile roof. Uh, yeah, like a ceramic tile or whatever. The roof uh, falls off, and it hits the important Roman senator or whoever... And so people are outraged. They think it was done on purpose because of all the tension that's going on. So they run to the rooftop and they find Judah with his mom and sister. They arrest all of them, even though Judah's pleading with Masala that it was an accident, it was an accident. And he even, Masala goes over and looks at the roof and he even accidentally knocks off a piece of tile. So he knows it was an accident, but he wants to get rid of Judah because he's mad at him. So Well, and I think too, like... He, he kind of wants to set an example. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not a pushover. Like, even though I know this guy, I'm going to use him and his family to show that I don't mess around. Yeah, that, that's a good point. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, so they all become imprisoned. Uh, Judah, it kind of jumps to like years later. And Judah is uh, basically a slave on a warship. And they have that famous scene where someone on the the bottom of the ship they have a drum and they're kind of beating it to a certain pace and they go you know ramming speed or you know they have these different speeds and the faster the beat the faster they have to roll the boat uh, which is a pretty famous scene in this movie so uh, that's where that happens and you get introduced to uh jack D uh, hawkins character who's uh quintus I thought you were going to say Jack Donaghy. I know, it was kind of... <laughs> 30 Rock. <laughs> slipped there a little bit, yeah. Alec Baldwin shows up, he's in this movie. No. Yeah. Um, Jack Hawkins, uh, he is the new admiral for this fleet, and he's visiting Judah, uh, the ship that Judah is this slave or rower on. And they kind of, I don't want to say hit it off, but uh, Quintus kind of notices Judah and for whatever reason, kind of takes a liking to him. In fact, before he leaves the ship, he asks the uh, who's ever in charge there to unlock his chain. Like, all the slaves are chained to the boat. Do we know how long Judah's been there by now? I'm I think it's like five remember. years. I think okay. it's a number of years yeah, later. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Quintus leaves the ship. Uh, they end up in a battle, and they get, you know... Uh, rammed into from another ship so now their ship is sinking and judah is able to escape because uh quintus had his chains unlocked so he's escaping and jumps off the ship and actually finds quintus who's kind of injured and knocked out and he saves his life which uh ends up being a big deal because while they're alone on basically this piece of driftwood uh they start talking and judah tells him his Kind of his life story that he was of something important, uh, someone of importance in Judea, and then the betrayal, and and everything. And uh, Quintus takes an even bigger liking to him, and in a big move, uh, brings him back to Rome and ends up adopting him as his son. So now Judah is a person of importance again, now within the Roman Empire. And he kind of has a nice scene with Jack Hawkins where he says, uh, I love you, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but I have to go back to Judea and find my family and kind of exact my revenge. So he's on his way back to Judea. He runs into Hugh Griffith's character, who's a sheik in this. He uh, 
uh, he's like a horse loving guy. He has uh, he's on his way to Judea, I think, for the big chariot race that's going to be going on, and uh, ends up becoming friends with with Judah, who is big into horses. You know, horse chariot racing and horse racing is obviously big back then, and Judah kind of shows that he knows his way around a horse race because he tells him you need to like rearrange your horses this one needs to be on the outside for this reason and this and that so the sheik uh kind of takes a liking to him and says you know what why don't you race my horses for me so uh judah gets enters into this chariot race which masala is racing in as well and this is like the famous scene of this movie i think it's a 10 minute long chariot race scene. yeah i mean it's one of the most like if not the most uh iconic scene like in movie yeah. history the chariot race and ben Hur is like i knew nothing about this movie besides that yeah coming and, into it and i think i even seen it on tv as like a kid every once in a while they would change it to like full screen mm -hmm. but whenever they would show the chariot scene they would revert back to widescreen because you just can't watch it in full screen uh but yeah it's like a i think it's 10 to 15 minutes of just straight chariot racing so it's really well shot scenes really intense because the whole time masala and judah are kind of going after each other uh, this is also where I feel like it's a cliche at this point where cars will have spikes in their wheels and they'll take bust out the tires of other cars. I'm pretty sure it came from this because Masala's chariot has spikes on the wheel and he kind of rams that into other chariots to take them out. So, <laughs> uh, but in the end, uh, Masala fall, falls out of his chariot, kind of gets run over by a bunch of people, Ben and Judah wins. And he goes to see Masala, who's not looking too hot. Um, and Masala admits that his mother and sister are still alive, but they're in the Valley of Lepers, which I feel like most people know what a leper is, but if in case, it's a very contagious, deadly disease. So if anyone had it back then, they would just put everyone who had that disease in the same area and kind of quarantined them. But Judah decides to go find them, which he does, and he brings them back to to Judea and to their old house, which the entire city is like empty at this point because they're at the trial of Jesus Christ. Which uh, Jesus, he actually pops up a couple times in this movie uh, when he when Ben Hur is a slave and he's kind of being marched from point A to point B. And no one is giving the slaves any water or things of that nature. Uh, they show they never show his face, which I think is probably a good move. Uh, but Jesus is there and he gives water to uh, Judah and other people. So uh, Judah knows who he is. Uh, he goes to see what all the commotion is about. And he sees Jesus like carrying the cross and falling down. And he recognizes him as the person that gave him water years earlier. So he runs to him and gives him water. Uh, and then, you know, everyone kind of kicks him out of the way and they go th through with the crucifixion. But in the end, Judah and his family are kind of sneaking out of town and they walk past, uh, Jesus on the cross. And then out of nowhere, a storm come like comes out of nowhere and they all take shelter in a cave. And then when they come out, his sister and mother don't have leprosy anymore. So it's kind of like their prayers are answered by Jesus Christ, who kind of cured him for the kindness and everything. And that's actually how the movie ends. So kind of ends on a high note for him and everyone involved. And yeah, that's kind of, that's the summary of this, uh, what, it's about three hour long movie. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, definitely a lengthy movie. And it's interesting as we were kind of talking about the synopsis of the movie, like it's it's pretty straightforward, and I mean, you mentioned pretty much everything that happens, so it's there. It's just a really uh, like well told out story. So it's like there there aren't a whole lot of events, but they just take place and they they stretch it out over three hours. Yes, yeah, it's a classic epic. Yeah, you know, this yeah. is that era of those big epic movies uh, with this and. 
like Lawrence of Arabia came out a couple of years after this. And, yeah, like they, you know. they take the time to tell the story. They don't rush through anything. Mm -hmm. yep. So Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, it was well paced. Um, this may have been one that we did split up into a few parts, but it, you know, it wasn't like, oh my God, this is so boring. Yeah, like, it's I'm just solely on the length of time. Um, maybe I'm saying this just because we reviewed it in the last episode, but similar to Irishman in the sense of it's a really long movie, three plus hours long, but I don't know if there's a whole lot that you would need to take out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a purpose to most of the story. Uh, and it's a very good story. It's just told over three hour period. So yeah, exactly. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, you're talking the scene at the end where his mother and sister more or less like cured of their leprosy. I don't remember exactly where I saw this. I, I might have seen this on um, I follow a number of different uh, like movie um, pages and stuff on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, they have a lot of behind the scenes stuff and they said that with that scene it was really cool the the mother i should find the story exactly but the mother and sister had the makeup that they had on their face to kind of mark their leprosy like their sores and their leprosy they had to like get rid of it they just put a different filter on the oh, camera okay. to make it look like it went away oh that's really good. they okay. just i mean they still had makeup on their face but the film or the, yeah. the, the, the lens or whatever filter they use on the camera yeah. reacted with the colors and stuff they had on their makeup. That's a cool, and it may look like... That's a cool... I actually... It's a super I, cool I kinda, practical effect. Let's say I kind of like old school movies like this where they had to get a little more creative yeah. with their effects like that. Yeah. Um, that reminds me of one of the first Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde movies that came out in the 30s and the lead actor, he won Best Actor for it. Um... Frederick Merrick, maybe. Anyways, so anyways, for his transformation scene from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, it was similar, where, like, the, these filters catch different colors. So his, and it was a black and white film, uh, his face was basically had different layers of paint on it. So, like, if you were to see him in person, his face would look ridiculous because of all these different paint colors on it. But they would use different filters to catch the different colors and they would do like one at a time to show him slowly progress into uh mr hyde oh so that's so cool it's, i think yeah i love stories like that where the uh, filmmakers had to get creative with their effects so. yeah and you know we talked about the chariot scene it's you know they weren't doing computer graphics back then they took five weeks 15,000 extras and literally thousands of feet of film to literally film mm -hmm. this section. It was yeah. all completely acted out. And it's it's amazing. I think <laughs> knowing, like watching that scene and knowing that everything in this is 100% authentic, it just it blows your mind. Uh, this is the first movie to win 11 Oscars, which was the most at the time, and it held that record, or it still holds the record, but it's now tied with two other films, uh, Titanic in 1997, and then Lord of the Rings Return of the King in 2003. Uh, this is probably my second favorite film out of those three. Lord of the Rings, number one, Titanic is number five. Oh, <laughs> good <laughs> one. It's right, funny, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this one helped. It held the record for for a long time. I might I keep saying that, but it it standalone held the record for a long, long time. And you can see why it's a big blockbuster movie. So I get why this won eleven Oscars. Yeah, and I know we're kind of getting into like these little extra side facts and things, but you know we talk about how Jesus isn't the main character, but he does pop up it does you know a lot of his life does intersect with mm -hmm. Judah's life uh so this is actually the only hollywood film approved by the vatican uh in their category of religious films huh? which i think is just kind of fascinating yeah. so it's not a story 100 percent about jesus but they apparently appreciated the portrayal of him and the story of ben hur <laughs> No, I, as I went along with it. I had that on here as a note to bring up that I thought they incorporated uh, like Jesus in this very well. I think if you do it too much, then it can get kind of heavy-handed. But if you do it too little, it's like why have him in the movie mm -hmm. at all? Right. So I think it was 
I think that it worked well, like, at the beginning. It's kind of like, oh, they're opening with the birth of Jesus. That's interesting. But then you kind of understand why. He kind of pops up throughout the film a couple yep. of times. And I do, I like that they don't show his face. It's kind of one of those things where you know he's of some of importance and he's such a huge figure that sometimes it's better just to not show the face. But, you know, I thought that it was done really well. Uh, I also think this movie, it had a huge impact on, obviously, movies from this point on but the one of my favorite movies kind of pulls a lot of uh ideas from ben-hur and that being gladiator where it's kind of some someone of importance becomes a slave that slave gets some power back and then goes and gets revenge yep very very similar plot line uh so you know interesting one of my favorite movies pulls a lot of that from this the only thing i had of note uh, that's negative is this movie has a terrible remake oh no oh that's right they yeah. just did it like a couple years ago like right 2016 uh, when i saw that trailer that i saw like they're re- I'm like why are you remaking ben-hur it's like one of the greatest epics of all time and you're remaking it and of course morgan freeman was in it he plays the hugh griffith uh character i'm pretty sure i never saw it but oh and he plays the sheik yeah i think so okay but I just remember when that movie came out, just going, what, what's Hollywood doing? They're remaking Ben-Hur? Yeah, totally unnecessary. So yeah, what score did you give Ben-Hur? You know, when I was kind of going through notes and stuff, I gave this one 8.3. I feel like maybe I need to bump that up a little bit, like an 8.4. Mm-mm. Five. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I mean, it's, it's a one-point difference, 8.4, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a well thought out epic story. Mm -hmm. It's a good movie. Yeah, I gave it a 9.1. Uh, yeah, not a lot that, as I know, like, I dislike about it. It's just a three hour long movie, so it's a little bit of a commitment there. But it's, yeah, it's just a really good story. And it's, you know, it's one of those epics. You get an intermission in the, in the middle. Oh my gosh, I was right. kind of miss those in movies a little bit. Uh, but yeah, it's just a really good movie. Yeah, and you know, I we mentioned that Charlton Heston is the main character in the Ten Commandments, and I know that's always on TV, like mm-hmm. around Easter. I'm almost more surprised that Ben Hur isn't shown on TV, like around, you know, yeah, Christmas or other, you know, Christian yeah. holidays or something. Because, like we said, it's not a Christian movie. It's not a movie about Jesus necessarily, but it does have some of that historical yeah, relevance so yeah, I mean, yeah he's a character in it and it, it's i mean it's i haven't seen the ten commandments from start to finish but it seems like you know a similar style movie yeah so. well i think it might even be longer than ben Hur. i think ten commandments i was gonna say when, well, yeah like, whenever it's aired on tv it's always it's like, like six, six hours, hours. Like, the commercial yeah, exactly it's insane. yeah so uh yeah so th- those are our scores for ben Hur. what other nominees or winners that we want to talk about from the 59 yeah not not a lot to bring up because benner did win 11 oscars so yep. it won most of them uh won you know best picture director actor supporting actor best actress was won by simone signorette uh for a room at the top and best supporting actress was won by shelly winters for the diary of anne frank oh wow okay yeah a, a couple things to note, uh, I hadn't seen, so Best Picture nominees, Ben-Hur, obviously, which won, uh, Room at the Top, The Nun Story, which I think had Audrey Hepburn in it, Diary of Anne Frank, and then Anatomy of a Murder. I hadn't seen any of these movies other than Ben-Hur, but my dad would always tell me, you have to see Anatomy of a Murder. You have to see Anatomy of a Murder. It, it stars James Stewart. Oh, and okay. I finally... S- I, I feel like I've heard of it. Okay, yeah. I would say that other than Ben-Hur, that would have probably been the leading contender to win yeah. Best Picture. Oh, okay. I was going to say, Room at the Top sounds familiar to me as well, okay. but I I'm, couldn't tell you what it's I guess, about. I guess I can't guarantee that, but I think j- with looking at all these nominations and everything, I would think Anatomy of a Murder was maybe the next leading contender. I could be wrong, though. Um, but that movie, I finally saw it. Earlier this year or last year, just because I always record random things on Turner Classic Movies and this was on there. I'm like, I got to see it. It's a courtroom drama. You know, I love courtroom dramas. Yes, you do. 
Uh, Jimmy Stewart plays a lawyer who is uh, representing a man who uh, murdered a bartender, but his he claims that it was in defense and that he, he's claiming temporary insanity because, now this is a topic that was very controversial to make a movie on back then, but he claims that the bartender had raped his wife. Mm-hmm. So just the topic of rape back in the 50s was... Not, not talked some, about. Yeah, not talked about. So this movie touched on that. That's what the movie's about. It's kind of a courtroom case, and that's what the plot line is. I don't need to go too far into it, but it was very, very good. Uh, highly recommend for anyone who looks for a good courtroom drama. I think it stands up even to this day, even though it, it was made in the 50s. I think it's still a really good movie. And then back to other nominations or movies for 59 the last thing i wanted to or felt like i needed to bring up was this was the year that some like it hot came out oh yeah so jack lemon got a best yes. actor nomination is is that the one where uh they like dress up like women yeah that's right with, yeah that's <laughs> with jack lemon and I want to say Tony Curtis. Maybe that's why I was saying when you were asking me who played Masala, my initial reaction was Tony Curtis, <laughs> <laughs> okay. which is wrong. But I think it's maybe subconsciously I was saying it because he's in Some Like It Hot. But yeah, they're on the run from some gangsters or something like that. And yeah, they dress up as women to be in hiding. It's a Billy Wilder movie who made a bunch of good comedies back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's all I have for... Uh, the other nominees and winners of 1959, did we want to, it's been a while, did we want to play a game of uh, Six Degrees? Yeah, I think let's do that. Let's, uh, I'm going from Ben-Hur to Knives Out, or vice versa, but between yeah. the two. Yep. Uh, do you want movies or actors? You, you decide. I feel like I always pick. And I don't know which one I'm usually better at. I'll say movies. I'll go with movies today. Okay. Okay. You pick which one you want to start out with, then. Uh, let's start with Knives Out. Okay. Let's see. Let's go with... The problem is, I don't know any other actors from that one link to Ben-Hur. Well, we'll figure it out. Yep. <laughs> we'll get there. Let's see. The easy one here is Chris Evans, but... Let's go with Don Johnson. He's uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's in one of your favorite movies, uh, Tin Cup. Yep, it's a movie. That's why I play golf. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yep, he's a <laughs> he's a jerk pro to Roy Tin Cup McAvoy. Uh, I'll go with Kevin Costner. Oh, Kevin Costner. So many choices. Um, or should I say Renee Russo and then you'd get her Oh myself. my god, I get her confused with Michelle Pfeiffer all the time. But no. I'll, go, I'll go with Kevin Costner. <laughs> um, hmm. <laughs> oh, this is so cheesy, but how about draft day? <laughs> draft day. Jennifer Garner. Jennifer Garner. 13 going on 30. God, why do I just keep thinking MCU people? Like, oh, Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> no, MCU. Oh, Brie Larson. No, MCU. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Judy, Wait, Judy Greer. Oh... Um, oh, she played a mom in Jurassic World. Yeah, she did. <laughs> For like a scene yeah, or two. Basically. I know she's in other yeah, stuff, but that's all I can think of uh, right now. Chris Pratt, MCU. No! I'm, trying, I'm trying to avoid the MCU. Um, Vincent D'Onofrio. Because, yeah, we need to switch to like an old movie <laughs> somehow. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the only movie I can think of him, think of that he's in is men in black <laughs> yeah he is the what is it the roach or well, yeah he's the the alien in that one yeah 
Um, well, the alien takes over his body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones? We're, we're getting older. Yeah, he's definitely older than most of the people we've <laughs> said already. Um, oh, uh, 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 the, the Fugitive? Mm-hmm. See the Fugitive? Yeah, it's his Oscar win. Okay, right there. yeah, there we go. Um, maybe Harrison Ford will open some stuff up. I'm not sure, but mm. he's still, he's older. Yeah. You're, <laughs> you're going to get mad at me, but uh, the Indiana Jones that has his dad in it, I don't remember which one that one's called. Oh, Last Crusade. <laughs> yeah, Last Crusade, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> Because I like that one the most. Mm-hmm. But I just, I, I can't keep the title straight. <laughs> what about Sean Connery? Mm, I know this is getting us back to more recent movies, but I'll say Finding Forrester. Great movie. That is a good movie. I will go with Matt Damon. Matt Damon? I don't remember Matt He's got one that. scene. At the end, he plays the l- lawyer. Because uh, Gus Van Sant directed Freddy Forrester, and he's also the director of Goodwill Hunting. So Matt mm. Damon came in and did, <laughs> did one scene. All right. That's fair. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go with a staple to this game, and I'll say Ocean's Eleven. Okay. Julia Roberts. Oh, Julia Roberts. How about Erin Brockovich? Yeah, finally got her Oscar for that movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will go with Albert Finney. Oh, Albert Finney's in Tom Jones. Hugh Griffith. Who's in Ben Hur? Yep. Yay! <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you brought up Tom Jones earlier. <laughs> yeah, I know. I so <laughs> many reasons I thought of this because, like, I brought. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that might have been the longest uh, game yet. And I have a feeling... That's it pro- a tough one. Yeah, it was. I have a feeling it probably could have been a lot shorter if I yeah. would have started out with, like, Christopher Plummer. Because <laughs> he's just really old to begin with. Yeah. And, like, gone off with, like, Sound of Music or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or even uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, you know, she's in some other... But, I don't know. I guess I decided to go the harder yeah. route. Well, we brought up a lot of... Uh, fun movies in that one. Yep. I, That'll be I mean, we got Men in Black, Aaron Brockovich, Indiana Jones, Tom all, Jones. All in one. Oh my god. That'll be an interesting graphic to make if I can fit everything yeah, in I, one. <laughs> I say that's just, you just make a list and that's, we'll, that's we'll it. We'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, cool. That was fun. Uh, let's see. What do we have coming up next week? We have a Great theme again next week. We've got bridges. Bridges is the theme. Really interesting week. theme. <laughs> For all you architects, engineers out there, bridges. <laughs> Tune in. Uh, no, we'll be talking about 21 Bridges and then the 1957 Best Picture winner, Bridge on the River Kwai. As always, please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a five-star review. Uh, follow us. Comment, share, retweet. All that good stuff on Twitter and Instagram. We are at Oscar Real Pod. For Matt and Haley, thanks for listening. Go see a movie this week. <laughs> <laughs>